Yeah. Okay. Let us go to God in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit, who testified with our spirit that we are your children, crying to you, Abba Father. We bless your holy name for the wonderful work that your Holy Spirit is doing in and each of us. As you mourn and make us into people that you would have us to be. Thank you for the convicting work that you did in our life and for maturing process that continues to take place. As we yield to your ongoing teaching, training and corrective action within us. Provide us as we pray uh, with your daily help and guidance that, you, that we may learn many lessons that you are seeking to teach us as we continue to comfort and correct us. Maybe we, may we be willing to learn all that you would teach and we be increasingly sensitive to your warnings and promptings. God wish them to our beloved elder Jason as he proclaimed your words in this ETS class the doctrine of God. Grant him discernment. Grant him your power as he speaks forth your word. Your word of life with clarity. Grant to us the open heart, the good soil, to receive your words of life. Kindle in us the fire of your love and fill us mm -hmm that we may experience you and be still to know that you are God. Plan us, O Lord, and renew us to be men and women after your own heart. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior and Deliverer, in his wonderful name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Adam Anthony. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, I hope you all can see the screen. Yeah, can. Okay, yeah. the full screen, right? All right, I will start today's class. Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Okay, welcome to the uh, first lesson of the ETS, um, Equipping the Saints for the Doctrine of God. So this is going to be a six lessons series um, starting from today on every Wednesday from 8 to 9.30. All right, um, let me begin with this um, doctrine. Uh, I have an email on the bottom right, jason underscore at hotmail.com. If you have any queries after the lesson, feel free to email to me uh, with a queries. I will try my best to answer to you. All right. Now, why do we study this topic about God? This is a question that somebody asked, why did I choose this topic, doctrine of God? Don't we all know about God? Well, if you ask many Christians, even in the church, perhaps some of us have a very clear understanding about Jesus Christ, God the Son. And some perhaps know more about the Holy Spirit. For example, especially those who have attended the class last year. But many a times, we have a very vague understanding about God. Maybe our understanding about God is somebody who is always sulking, an old man, you know, always angry, full of wrath in the Old Testament, punished at will. Is that the right understanding of God the Father? So it is critical and important for us as Christians, as long-time Christians in the church especially, to have a good understanding about God. And I'm sure all of us grew up, some of us grew up in church when we were young. Um, we sing songs in the Sunday school and I like this song a lot when I was young. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. I want to know you more. I want to know you more. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. 
Does everyone truly know God? That is especially very important. And guess what our uh, beloved Apostle Paul says? For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and, and him crucified. This is one of the most prominent apostles in the New Testament, Apostle Paul. He's knowledgeable, he's educated, yet he says, I decided to know nothing except God. This is what I want to know. Know Christ and know everything else. If you know Christ, nothing else come close to second point. All right. What about us? Do we know Jesus Christ? Do we know God? Do we know what does it mean Christ crucified for us? You see, the Bible portrays Paul as one who is circumcised on the eighth day. He's a person from Israel, a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin, one of the 12 tribes, a Hebrew of Hebrews, meaning that he's very uh, knowledgeable in the ancient text about God. He's a Pharisee. He's so zealous. He persecuted the church. He's extremely religious, the Bible says, and he's blameless. Philippians 3, 5 to 6 says. And guess what? He says, indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. You know, the word rubbish actually is, is very mild here. The original Greek text is manure or waste or something disgusting. Paul is saying, everything I have, no matter how well educated I am, I count them as rubbish. Nothing compares to knowing Christ. Knowing Christ, knowing God is so worthy, everything else is rubbish. What about us? Do we know Jesus Christ more than everything else? And it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, Walk in the manner and worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing in the knowledge of God. This is what Paul keep emphasizing in three books of the New Testament. He wants us to know God more and more. No one, none of us can say that we know God enough. It is always discovering. It is always increasing. It is always knowing Him. All right? So what about us? Do we know God more and more each day of our lives? Paul tells us it's so important. All right? Now, what about Peter? Another important or prominent apostle, right, of the 12. Peter is um, well recognized as the leader of the 12 or the spokesperson of the 12. He says, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. We ought to increase, which is why one of the reasons this year that we want to talk about God is we want all of us to have a good understanding, good knowledge of God, all right? And this knowledge is just not hate knowledge. It is an intimate relationship. If you know the word know, it is not just information. The word know, it is something intimate. It is developing a relationship. And Peter says, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true, in his son Jesus Christ, he is the true God and eternal life. So the word know is it is so important, all right, that we cannot undermine the knowledge of God and building a close relationship with God. And this particular passage tells us knowing the son is knowing God because Jesus Christ is the true God. He is true and he is eternal life. Now, we go through Paul, we go through Peter. Now, what about Jesus Christ? Now, this question asks, what is eternal life? If I ask the question, even to Christians, some of them will say, well, eternal life seems to be living forever and ever in heaven, praising God for a long, 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 everlasting period of time. 
Now, I just want to make some correction to this understanding. Because in heaven, it is eternity. There is no concept of time in heaven or in eternity. It's not the passing of time like one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. In the eternal state, there is no time concept. So eternal life is not in a sense just living forever and ever. Jesus Christ has told us very clearly what is eternal life. And some of us will be shocked to know what is the definition of eternal life. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 17, verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus Christ was praying in John chapter 17. John chapter 17 is the high priestly prayer where Jesus Christ, before his arrest, um, his arrest um, to be crucified on the Friday, the night before on the Thursday, he was in the garden praying to God. The whole chapter 17. And he said this in verse 3. This is eternal life, Father, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus Christ is praying for the disciples, for his followers to know God. If Jesus Christ himself is values knowing God, something so important, it is important for us to know, to know God. It's not a length of time, eternal life, but a quality of life. A life that is with Christ, a life that is eternity with the Father, intimate relationship. Okay, To know God, the true God of the Bible, is to have an intimate relationship with God. Now, the question goes again. All right, I raised a lot of questions, so I just to trigger us to think. Why did God create us? Now, the very standard question is to um, enjoy God and glorify Him forever. But what does that mean? All right, now, just bring us back to Genesis. When God created Adam and Eve, and of course, before that, all the natures and the beasts, of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea. God created everything, and at last, he created humankind. And he said, God said everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So in God's eternal plan, when he creation, in his creation, he's so pleased with his creation, and he said everything was good. And why did he create all this? So that he wanted his creation to know him to have a relationship with him, to give him glory. God did not just create the world and human being, and he left them. The Bible says God was with them. God even walked in the garden with Adam and Eve, talking to them, speaking to them, teaching them. So God wants his creation to have an intimate relationship with him, to know him, to commune with him, to fellowship with him, and to enjoy God's creation and to give him glory for his creation. So that is God's eternal purpose, original intent. All right. So we are made, in a sense, to know God, to have fellowship with Him, and to glorify Him in all creation. That is God's creation. So the knowledge of God is key to everything. If we do not have this knowledge of God, we do not worth to live this life. And we are not should not be here. So what does the Bible say about those who don't know God? And you'll be shocked to see the seriousness of this. The Bible has told us it's important for us. We are created to know God and to enjoy Him forever, to communicate, commune with Him, to have fellowship. But what happened to those who don't know God? Now, I bring you to this first Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. And you'll be shocked to hear this. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Eli is a priest. He's probably a religious man, a good person with a good ministry to serve God, a good, good godly man, but he's, in a sense, a lousy father because his sons were worthless, the Bible says. What does worthless mean? Useless and meaningless. And because why? They do not know God. Any one of us, or even those who do not know God, we are, in the Bible, it tells us we are worthless, useless, and meaningless. Our life on earth will have no meaning. So if we know God, we know the true meaning and purpose of our existence. You and I today has a purpose. We are child of God. We believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We have a purpose to live. Even this temporal 
period on earth. One day we will meet God in heaven for all eternity. We know we will enjoy God forever in all his glory. That is the purpose because we know God. But those who do not know God, he has no meaning. He has no purpose. His existence could be 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, 90 years. The moment he breathed his last full stop, he thought he's the end, but he will face an eternal judgment. But on his life on earth, he will just work hard, make money, survive without eternal meaning. In AD 354, there's this um, very religious man, uh, godly man, St. Augustine, perhaps some of us will know him. He says, there's a God-shaped vacuum in every man that only Christ can fill. You see, every person, whether you are a God-believing person or you do not believe in God, there's always this innate element in us to know that nothing can satisfy that, that vacuum. But for those who have God, who have Christ, who have the Holy Spirit the moment we believe in Him, that vacuum is filled by God's presence. We are satisfied because we know we have eternal life. We know that we have a hope, we have a security because our faith in Jesus Christ will bring us eternal life. But for every person, even though he does not know God, that vacuum can never be satisfied. He can fill it with alcohol, he can fill it with money, greed, lust, everything he finds in this world, but he can never satisfy that emptiness. So we are all created to know the true God. If we do not know the true God, we will know, never know any peace. We will never be satisfied. All right. So the person will walk, live his life. He will work hard, but never feel satisfied. Okay. Now, and again, Paul reminds us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 to 8, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Now, Paul does not mean his word. Paul is not a diplomatic person like many of us possibly. Yeah. Paul tells us as it is. If you know God, you have meaning and purpose. You have eternal life. If you do not know God, prepare to face judgment. This judgment is when Jesus Christ comes on his second coming, there's no more chance. You will face the judgment of God. When Jesus Christ comes on his second coming, he will be the judge, he will be the king. All right. Now, on his first coming, he came as a savior. He died on the cross to bear our sins. He comes to save, to seek that which is lost. But at his second coming, there is no second chance. If you do not know God, that is them. That is eternal condemnation. That is Paul's warning through the word of God in the scripture. All right? He said it as it is. So, no God, those who come to know God and give him glory, God bring them in his presence eternally. So, Revelation 21 tells us the whole chapter, we have a new heaven and new earth prepared for us. So, for those who have attended my two uh, lessons ago about Revelation, you know, this new heaven, new earth is such a glorious presence in Christ, in God, in the Holy Spirit. We will enjoy Him forever and ever when we know Him. But for those who refuse to know Him, who reject the gospel, who refuse to believe in the Lord and rebel against Him, God says one day He will remove them from His presence eternally. Because in His lifetime, He doesn't want God anyway. So for all eternity, he will be taken away from God's presence. And that's how serious it is. And uh, what about God himself? What did God say about us knowing him? I will be referring a lot to the scripture so you will know what God says, all right? So God tells us in his word. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, 24. This is God himself saying, all right? Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. There are people who boast, who are very smart, PhD, read a lot of books, knows a lot. Let the mighty man, let not the mighty man boast in his might, okay? No matter how riches. But let him who boasts in, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, 
and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. So this word, this passage is so encouraging to me. Now, if you look at your life, I look at my life, and I'm, I'm not I don't, I'm not very wise. I, I didn't study a lot. I mean, I mean, I, I didn't get high de, high good degree or whatever. I'm not powerful and strong in the secular world. Neither have I a lot of riches. But when I see other people, all this, you don't have to compare them because this is not what God desires. God says, if you want to boast, just boast one thing, that he understands and knows me. If you understand and knows God, you are well better than all who have wisdom, all who have might, all who have riches. So God wants us to know him, to know who he is, to know what he does, and to hear what he says. So I urge all of us to be encouraged by this, right? If you spend your time, quiet time, your Bible study, your prayer, listen to his word, you will know him better and better. You will grow in your spiritual maturity. God says he desires that. He, this is what delights him. This is what he's happy with. This is what he's pleased. And then in Hosea 6 verse 6, again in Old Testament, he reminded us, I desire steadfast love, not sacrifice. I desire the knowledge of God rather than burnt offering. So in a sense, right, God wants us to know him, not so much we sacrifice things to him. Not even you sing the best song in worship. Not even you contribute a lot of ties or whatever or do a lot of work for him too. But he just wants us to know him. Nothing we can do to please God other than our love and to know him intimately. God wants to have a good relationship, intimate relationship with him. And in the New Testament, he says, Beloved, John, encourage us, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So you see, the word love and know comes together. If you love God, you know God. If you know God, it is He who loves God. So this knowledge of God, this knowing God is, is an intimate relationship. Okay, Not hate knowledge, not how much you know, how much I know, but it's a loving relationship. There are people who know a lot about the scripture, about the Bible, but his life is just not no intimate relationship with God. He doesn't spend time praying or talking to God or listen to God's word. Okay. So now we go to another question. Now, Elder Jason is saying it's important to know God. The question asks is, do we know the right things about God? What are the correct things we know about God? Because what happens if you know the wrong thing? If you know the wrong things about God, then we have a wrong view of God. If you have a wrong view of God, we are worshipping the false or wrong God. So if we are worshipping the wrong God, we are just committing idolatry. So it is important. Yes, we know don't God is important, but you ought to know the right things about God and not the wrong things about God. Okay? And the only way we can know the right thing about God is from what the scripture has defined for us who God is. Not anybody, not anybody who thinks God should be like that or God should be, not A says this, B says this, or C says this. Seems like these are very well-known people. No, we are not listening to the human word, but only what the scripture has defined for us. That is the standard. Whether you like to listen or not, the scripture says, as it is, okay? Not based on our opinion of how God should be like. Or some of us think, oh, yeah, God, you should be like this. God, you should be more compassionate. Should be, no, don't be so angry. Don't be so judgmental. No, God does not depend on how we think of him. Not our opinion, but what God says, okay? If we define ourselves how God should be like, some people, right? Okay, I want God should be like this. So what I mean? What does it mean? It means that we are actually creating our own gods. We are inventing gods, which is what, that is why there are so many false religions. Everybody wants to create their own gods. The answer is no. None of us has the right or the qualification to say how God should be like. Okay? Only the Bible says so. So now let's go to the proper of the 
uh, today, one of the main topic just was just an introduction, right? So is there a God? The question is, uh, people who ask this, how do we prove that God exists? So if there's a God, how do we know who is the true God? Everybody tells us they believe in God. Is there a God? How to prove that God exists? If there's a God, how do we know who is the true God? Sometimes we encounter friends or relatives or colleagues to ask questions like this. How do we answer them? The Bible tells us two things. There are two types of fools. You see, these are not my words. Huh? The Bible says so. Huh? The first type of fools, those who claim there is no God. Who are these people? The atheists, right? Atheists are those people who don't believe in the existence of God. I'm not talking about agnostics. Agnostics are those people who do not know whether God exists or not exists. They are unsure. But atheists are the ones who directly declare there is no God. They think that they are above them. Or another group of fools is those who invent their own God. These are two types of fools. And say, wow, why are you such a strong language? No, not from me. It's where the scripture says. Where does it so? So when you preach or you share a sermon, right? Or you try to evangelize, you say, yeah, we believe that God, God is true and is living. And then this person say, no, I cannot see God. It's because I cannot see God. Therefore, there's no God. So this person or this fool is using his own cleverness to refute God's existence. Just because he can't see God, he cannot hear God talking to him in an audible voice. Based on his own senses, he decides that God does not exist. And if you ask him, has he gone to the ends of the world to find God? The answer is definitely no. He has not been to everywhere. So how can he qualify that he does not know God exists or not? Now, and he will say, if God shows himself to me, then I will believe. Just like a genie, right? You rub the, 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 the oil lamp, then someone appears. Now, this fool is self-centered and is proud. He made demands that God must listen to him. God, you must appear right now in my room or in the sky. The moment you appear, I can see you, then I believe. They make demands of God. He assumed that by seeing with his eye, he proved that something exists. And do you realize that huh? our eyesight does not see everything? But there are many things in the world that we can't see but exist. Air, for example. We don't see air, but we know air exists because we can see the wind moves through the leaves. We can breathe. We assume, but we don't see air in the first place. We don't see the first cosmos telescope, but we know galaxies exist. There are many times we believe things by faith, not just by sight. All right, The Bible says it's not by sight. Eyesight is the lowest form of proof. Okay, so this fool says there's no God. What does the Bible say? Psalms 14 verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There's none who does good. So this fool is a person who decides in his heart already, there's no God. Not because there's no God, but because they are corrupt. Okay, so now, if you understand what does it mean by God, you must know that God is infinite. Man is so minute. We are so vulnerable. We are so finite. Okay, God is God and we are just men or women. All right? We are human. God is divine and we are not divine. We, are, we will die. We are fleshy. We are carnal. And we are not spiritual in the sense that spiritually divine uh, being. And God is sovereign, means God is full of authority. He's above all. He has powerful to decide anything. But we are not. We are not sovereign. The only person sovereign is the, the one who says he's sovereign because he doesn't want to wear a mask, right? We are not sovereign at all. There are so many things we cannot do. Yet we have the audacity to say that there's no God. God is the creator and we are just the created beings. So if you look at this, there's a gap. There's a qualitative difference. Qualitative difference means we cannot compare to the divine, spiritual, invisible, sovereign being. God has no obligation to listen to our demands to appear at man's back and call. Okay? Now, the Bible tells us, sometimes you read this uh, quite sarcastically. The, the word of God can be quite sarcastic. Why do you read this? 
who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what men show him his counsel. This verse is trying to say, men, have you ever measured the spirit of God? Do you know how infinite the spirit of God is? Do you want to be the counsel for God? Do you want to be the God wise man and tell God what to do? For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Romans chapter 11, verse 34. If you read the scripture very carefully, God, through the word, is trying to tell men, look, you are just a finite being. Don't overestimate yourself to be God's counselor. If you think there's no God, you're just a fool. You are never wise to advise how God should be, how should he behave, what his nature should be. Okay? As a unbeliever trying to overpower, override God, for God listen to him. But for the true believer, he submit himself to God. We are not qualified to tell God what to do or how to make him more believable to people. We are not his counselors. We believe by faith. We submit to God's guidance. I like this word. Someone said this. To understand God, you need to stand under God. You don't stand above God. To understand God, you stand under God. You, the moment you submit and surrender yourself to God, you humble yourself before God, you read His Word, God will reveal His Word, His knowledge to you so that you know Him more and more. But if you are proud, you try to be boastful in your own cleverness, just like the Pharisees did, they never know true Jesus Christ, even though he appeared to them in flesh. All right? So now, we don't expect God to appear in a genie, in the, in the cloud that God says, I am God. We don't need to do that. If we can prove God to exist and to make God appear as we wish, then we are greater than God. All right? God existence is not dependable to, on our debate or discussion. Now, you can talk to people who are very eloquent or sounds to be very acknowledgeable, or even those who are sometimes very scientific minded, they can talk and talk and talk a lot. But the, the, no matter how they discuss or debate or win in their uh, grips of tongues, God's existence does not depend on them winning the debate. All right? God's existence is not even for us to prove in a laboratory. We can't prove everything in the laboratory. We cannot even prove many theories in the laboratory. We don't prove God existence in a scientific formula. God existence is for us to believe by faith. By faith. We trust in the word. We believe that Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that God sent to die on our cross for our behalf. And the moment we believe in Jesus Christ, God sent His Holy Spirit in our lives to be with us eternally forever. That is what gospel is all about. That is faith. All right? So remember the question Moses was talking to God, you know, at a bush fire, um, burning bush, not bush fire, right? I'm about burning bush. And Moses asked God, if the people of Israel ask, what is your name? What shall I tell them? How, do, how can I introduce you to, to, to the Israel? You know what God said? I am who I am. Now, if you read this, God, just use a short sentence. God does not need to explain a long sentence. Oh, I do this, do this, do this. I you can prove me by this, by this. I can give you a long theory through the formula how to prove. No, God, God just says, I am who I am. You believe me, you know me. You know me, you love me. If you do not believe, know me, you will be damned. God just says that. I am who I am. And it's a present tense means I'm living eternally forever and ever, and I'm true. All right? So if God is the I am, Moses just need to tell the people God is I am. God says so, he is. All right? So no matter how people shout, there's no God, and remember this, the existence of God does not depend on man shouting as dry as he can, there's no God. God exists, or God is, and the I am is I am, regardless of man's opinion or debate. Okay, so again, the fool, the fool says in his heart, there's no God. Now, the reason why the Bible says they say there's no God is because of the second part. 
The reason is they are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There's none who does good. Even those atheists, uh, sometimes they truly know that God exists, but they just want to shout so loud that no God exists because they don't know want to face a holy God. Because they are sinful, they are evil, and they do hope that there's no God exists. They wish there's no God because God is holy. And they just want to brush it off, say there's no God. The moment there's a holy God, or there's God, which means that God is holy, because they are unholy, they are evil, they're going to be accountable to this holy God. They're going to face judgment. And they don't want it. The Bible says because they are corrupt, they do abominable deeds, there's none who does good. So the people who say there's no God is because in the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there's no God. So the Bible says these are the wicked people who refuse to accept God's existence even though the evidence for God's existence through creation, through his conscience, through his vacuum inside him is so obvious. All right. The unrepentant sinner, they hope there's no God. Yeah, they wish. They know that God is holy and will one day judge their, all their evil acts. They do not want to have a God that will punish them. This is their true intention. So they will shout, there is no God. How do we know that? The Bible tells us the plain story. In Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, remember when God created everything was good, right? God was walking with them, communicating with them, talking to them, telling them, you can eat everything in the fruits in the garden, no? don't eat the fruits of the throne. No? So God is communicating with them, having fellowship in the garden. But the moment they fall in Genesis 3, they sin, they eat the food that God has forbidden them. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife what? hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, the moment they sin, because they are unholy, they are blemished, they are evil, they know that they've fallen short of God's glory, they hide themselves. They cannot see God, the holy God anymore. That is the reason why when a person sins or when a person loves his sin, they want, they desire, they hope there is no God because God is holy and they are not. Okay? So, Brothers and sisters, let's be encouraged. Let's not be overwhelmed by atheists or those people who have the glib of tongue to prove everything that God does not exist because, you know, they are, they are evil and they do not want a holy God. So when there's a holy God, there's a sinful person, there's a gaff. They cannot come together and God does not compromise sin in his presence. There's no way. An unholy person will forever be removed from God's presence for all eternity unless our sins are forgiven, our sins are cleansed, our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why the message of the cross, the gospel of salvation is so important for us. And John tells us plainly, John chapter 1. I love the book of John. One day I want to do um, the, the book of John again from chapter verse by verse from John chapter 1 onwards. All right. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Talking about Jesus Christ. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Jesus is God coming in human flesh, full of glory, full of, full, full of grace, right in the presence of the time of Israel, in front of the Jews, in flesh and blood, talking performing miracles, speaking God's word, yet the people refuse this holy man, this holy person who is the son of God. Why? Because they are evil. They hated Jesus Christ so much to the extent they want to kill him. Because when Christ comes, their culture, their faith system, their structure is totally broken down. All right? Jesus was the light that shines in the darkness. Because they are in the darkness, they don't want this light. The people rejected Jesus. It is so true. And even John chapter 3 elaborated on that. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does the wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. So you see, those who people who practice 
evil things are, uh, even you look at the world now, uh, those who commit theft, robbery, uh, uh, and crime, usually what they want to do, they always do in the dark, right? Because darkness can camouflage them, darkness can hide them, cover their face, nobody can see, all right? Uh, of course, there are those who are desperate who will, will rob in the daytime, but most of the crime you know will be done in the night, in the darkness because light will expose everything. And those who love darkness, they hate the light. It's natural. There's no true believer who says, I love Jesus, I love bright the day and the light, yet I love my sin. And those people who love the sin, yet they say they want to love Jesus, you know they are not true. Those who love darkness will hate the light. And those who truly love the light, when the moment they sin, I'm not saying that they're going to be perfect, the moment they sin, they hate themselves for sinning. They feel remorseful. They will repent and cleanse them of that sin. Ask God for forgiveness. So light and darkness cannot come together. All right, You either hate one or love the other. And Arsis Pro, the the, the late um, uh, famous uh, pastor and theologian said, the holiness of God is traumatic to unholy people. And unholy people hate the holiness of God or holy God. They will reject him. Okay. So the second fool, I don't believe in the God of the Bible. I want to invent my own God. And the true Christian will preach the true God of the Bible, not the Bible, God of any imagination, but the one who refuse the holy God of the scripture will want to invent their own God. And of course, they will invent a God that suits their liking, suits their desire. They does not want the holy God, which is why, you know, there are so many different types of religion. It suits their own passion and lust. You know, the Greek gods, the 12 Greek gods, if you do a study of the 12 Greek gods, they are um, sexual immorality, they have cruelty, they have abuse, all sorts of things, because this is what human nature is. Human nature will invent God that are similar to the human nature. The Bible says in Isaiah 42, verse 17, they are turned back and utterly put to shame, who trust in calf idols, who say to these metal images, you are our gods. So this second fool will invent a God and give definition to the God that suits their own darkness. Exactly what happened in the ancient book, when the um, the the Jew, the Israelites built the golden calf, all who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know that they may have put to shame. God says all these idols are worthless. You can fashion everything you can, the most beautiful gold, diamond, or whatever ornaments you can place on the idols. It's shameful. Nothing. And the Israelites worship the golden calf. Again, the strong word of God in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 14 to 15. Every man is stupid and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols. For his images are false and there's no breath in them. They are worthless, a work of delusion. At the time of their punishment, they shall perish. God says, all these idols, graven image are useless, worthless. Ezekiel 14 verse 6 says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thou says the Lord God, Repent and turn away from your idols and turn away from your faces from all your abominations. Right from Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation, God is saying, I am who I am. I am the true and living God. I want my people to whom I created to know me and to love me and to glorify me and to worship me only. And I'm a jealous God. I do not want anyone to worship any other gods or idols other than me. That is why he gives the Ten Commandments and the First Commandment and Second Commandment says it all. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. God is so strong He's in his word. There's no ambiguity in this. There's no wishy-washy, you know, you know, you can do this, do that. No, you shall not. You shall have no other gods. But sometimes, you know, people create idols. And even for Christians, huh, can I remind ourselves, some of us wear cross, some of us have cross at home. Please, 
I would urge that you don't do not even put your crosses at home or crucifix as an idol. All right. Don't think that it has power to work off evil or not. And I remember, you know, this photo of Jesus Christ, right? In my old house when I stayed. Yes, my dad and my family used to have this put at home. Well, you can have pictures of Jesus Christ, and I'm not sure whether Jesus Christ truly looked like that. You can use it as probably a, a, a way to remind you of Christ or the cross to remind you of Jesus Christ dying for you. Yes, to if it, if it helps you to have a closer relationship, to meditate upon God, that is good, that's fine. That is, that is uh, good to do. But do not bow or do not worship or treat it like an uh, idol. That is forbidden. That is not what God desires. Okay, We do not worship any statues. We do not lift up and exalt any idols in our heart or even in a physical sense. Never do that. Okay, which is why many false religions spring up to deceive, to destroy, and to destroy. They pray to say this is the right way to heaven. This is the true God. That way is the true. Now, don't listen to all the wrong teachings or twisted teachings. What did Jesus say in his own words? John chapter eight verse forty-four. You are of your father the devil. Jesus is rebuking the Jews or the Israelites, huh? The Jews that, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he's a liar and the father of lies. He's talking about Satan, the devil. And his objective, Satan's objective is to tell lies, to deceive people and draw them away from the holy God. And how does he do that? Simple, one way, to create false gods, to create false idols so that people worship the idols or worship the wrong God or to create definition of God that suits their passion and love so that men can create and invent their own gods. Satan is the father of lies. Okay? Now, the subtle ones, and I have to say this, even those who um, uh, use the name of God, use the name of church, even use the name of the Bible, they can teach you the wrong things about God. You may say things that God wants to bless you with material things. God will make you wealthy or healthy. God he has to claim by faith, speak the things into existence, then name it and claim it theology. God will enlarge a territory, give you a lot of wealth, or you can come as you, as you are, continue in your sin. God will accept you. All these are not the teachings of the Bible. All these are not the teaching of God. It sounds religious. It sounds Good to hear, but they are not. Prosperity gospel is not the true gospel. All right, it portrays the wrong God of the Bible. It's a God of wealth, health, and prosperity. No difference from the Chinese God, Fulu So. You can tell you God loves you, loves you in your sin. You can continue in your sin. God does not hate you because of your sin. No, Bible is so clear. God hates sin. You come in your sin, yes, but you must repent of your sin. You must cleanse. Ask for forgiveness of your sins and you will hate your sins and to be holy as God is holy. The Bible says, be perfect or be holy as I am holy. So you cannot come in your sin and live in your sin and love your sin. That is not the true gospel. All right? Even your wealth. The Bible is so clear. You cannot serve two masters. You will hate the one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. God and money does not exist together. I'm not saying that rich Christians cannot be a good Christians. It is not that way. But those people who, who think that the wealth is their God, the wealth is where they prove that they are very prosperous in God's blessing. No, that's not what it means. When your allegiance, when your loyalty, when your faithfulness to God, you will show, like what Paul says, I count everything else as rubbish. I count everything else worthless compared to knowing God. You must Bear God as the first priority in your life. Yes, you can be still wealthy, just like Abraham is a wealthy Christian, wealthy believer, right? But you must uphold God as the first priority, as the Lord of your lives, okay? And R.C. Pro, I uh, just want to, I see his quote is very good for us. A God who is all love, all grace, all mercy, no sovereignty, no justice, no holiness, and no wrath is an idol. Therefore, a true church 
preach about love of God, yet he also preached about the wrath of God. A true church preached about grace of God, he also preached about the holiness of God. When the true church preached about the mercy of God, he also teach about the justice of God. All right? Now, and the Bible is very clear, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Yes, we know God is love, God is grace and merciful, yet when God judge, when Christ comes on his second coming as judge and king, don't fall into the hand of the living God in the wrong way. You have no way back. And that is eternal condemnation. And the Bible once again reminds us, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Even the wrath of fire in hell is where the wrath of God is there. Okay? The wrath of God is in hell, inflicting vengeance upon those who reject him. Those who do not know God or who believe in the wrong God will suffer under God's wrath for all eternity. This is God's word, not from me. Okay? If you believe in the wrong God, you are them. Remember the three friends of Daniel? The three friends of Daniel? They refused to bow to the image of the king. If you walk away from the true God, you are them. If you want to follow the idols or other gods of your invention, you are them. Your whole eternity is at stake. Don't be a fool. Don't be the first fool or not be the second fool. Okay? And how do we know that God exists? Um, I think I want to continue because there's a number of things to cover. Uh, let, let, let me continue. How do we know that God exists? Now, these are questions that some people will ask, especially uh, when it's a new believer and you, yeah, you face people who really ask such questions in a genuine heart. How do we answer them? Now, I can just say that I have no formula to prove that God exists. I'm not, I cannot, as I mentioned, I cannot use science or laboratory to prove God exists. God's existence is not for us to prove because we are not his counselor. We are not above God, but for us to believe by faith. And the way that we believe by faith is God reveals through his word. Faith comes through the hearing of God's word. And to hearing of God's word is because God reveals the word to us. So God reveals not only through his word, but God reveals through a number of other things. Let me draw it then out to you. God reveals through creation. God reveals through conscience. God reveals through Christ when he comes on his first coming. God in human flesh. And God reveals through his word. Now these are some of the ways that God reveals himself. One is the general revelation, which is the creation or conscience. But there's also a special revelation to Christ and his word. That's it. And these are sufficient for us to believe by faith that God exists. Let me elaborate a little further. Now, Romans chapter 1, verse 19 to 20, these are the powerful word of Paul, okay, telling us about God's existence. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. I really thank God for this creation. I thank God for created the whole universe, the world. Because only through God's creation, we can see that there is a creator. And with that creator, we know God is the creator and God is I am who I am who create all these things to them. It is so plain because God showed it through physical things that he made. And when the things that he made just show that God is powerful, God is so wise, God is so knowledgeable, and God show it to us that we have no excuse to deny. We look at the nature, we cannot deny God exists. When one looks at God's creation, he or she has no excuse that God exists. And by the way, these two photos are what I took when I was um, traveled uh, years ago. I just look at the nature, I look at the mountain, I look at the river and see how to deny that God 
all these things appear on its own. It's impossible. You need a stronger faith to believe that this thing appear by itself than to believe that God created them. So you through the cause and effect, of course, there's a lot of argument. I don't have time to go to every every other argument. I just bring out a few that I think is easier for us to understand. Cosmology argument is cause and effect. If you have a cause, there will be an effect. If there's an effect, means there's a cause. All right. So if you look at the effect, what's the effect? This creation, this earth, this world, things that we can see on earth, things that we can see through telescope in the galaxies. We live in this world, we can touch, we can see, we can hear, we can breathe, we can have senses to feel. When these things, this effect just tells us one thing, there is a cause. Some higher being must have made this world. It is impossible for all these things to appear by itself. This is a cause and effect kind of argument. It is, it is not the best argument that I can come up with to prove, but it is something of an analogy to tell us, to help us to use our finite understanding logically to understand. Okay? There's a design. You look at the nice design, the river, the sea, stop at the boundary where it stops. The mountain er erected at the place that it erects. The land starts from where it begins and where it ends. Now, all this design, what does this show? There is a designer. There's one who designs it, just like a painter who paints something. You see an art piece means there is an artist or painter who paints it. The paint or the art piece does not come it by itself. There's a designer. That's why you have this incredible design that we have in this world. Just like a watch. You have an iWatch, you have an iPhone. You know Steve Jobs was the one who designed the phone, iPhone. You have a watch, means there was a watchmaker, isn't it? The watch, you put it there, you cannot assemble by itself. The screws, the nuts, the belts, the the seconds, the minutes, the hands, doesn't come by itself. Someone must have assembled them. If you look at the cosmos, the creation, there is a creator. It is a simple analogy. Now the story goes, because this is just a story, huh? Isaac Newton, the famous scientist, he was in a, in, in a school and he was designing this solar system whereby the, 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 the sun with all the planets evolving around and he's made it such a way that it turns by itself and it's lighted up, it's so beautiful. He left it on the table and he left the laboratory. And then his students came. After that, he, they look at the wonderful, beautiful design on the table. And he start to say, wow, what a beautiful model that the, the planets move around each other without knocking each other. It is all symmetrical uh, and it's all, all moving at the right speed at the right angle, at the right circumference, uh, diameters and all this. And they start to say, who designed this? Who, who made this? Then Isaac Newton came in and said, no, this thing appeared by itself. It was just appeared on the table by itself. And his students start to say, that's impossible. It can't be. It cannot be appeared by itself, such a beautiful solar system model who made it so efficiently and uh, run by itself without any error. And Isaac Newton says, if you believe that such a model, a small model that appeared on the table must be designed and made by somebody, why do you all not believe that the real world that we live in with the perfect solar system moving in equilibrium and in tandem with each other, that does not knock into each other, collide into each other, why do you not believe the real solar system is created by a creator. It's such a simple analogy that there's no excuse. God's invisible attributes and divine nature can be seen. Now, so the argument for the atheists huh, who don't believe in God, there's no God, huh, the argument is nobody times nothing in this world becomes everything we have now. This is what they believe. No one multiplied by Nothing in this world, totally no cells, no nothing, no molecules, no material, becomes everything in the world. This is so puzzling. But for us who believe God exists, there's somebody that multiplies that nothing in this world. When God says, let there be light, and things appear, everything from day one onwards, 
until the sixth day. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. God created everything. This is the argument that we believe God exists. And not only this faith, it's not a blind faith, but a faith that is strong, strongly rooted in the word of God. And God created all things. God is the somebody, the higher being that created all things. And he told us so clearly, so plainly, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Full stop. I, I like the way that God writes the scripture. Just like, I am who I am. Full stop. That's it. God does not have to explain everything. Just the simple few words here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. You know, in just these words, huh, it tells us the time in the beginning. It tells us who God. It tells us what he do, creation. He tells us heaven, space. He tells us earth, material. And he tells everything, time, material, space, God, creation. Just four sim few simple words. God created heaven and earth. And even in John, John chapter 1 is about a bit echo in Genesis 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. So you see, Paul, when he writes in Romans, right, from all the creation in the world, he have no excuse. He actually knows God creation in Genesis. Just like John Echo, God created everything. So simple to know that God exists. God, the creator, reveals to us from the scripture how this world came about. So God exists, God created the world. And the second thing that we can know God exists is conscience. The Bible says, Romans chapter 2, verse 15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while the conscience also bear witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even accuse them. Sometimes we read this, some, some people will not understand what it means. Now, let me try to explain to you. The work of the law is written on their heart. What does it mean? We have a sense of morality. We know the right and wrong. The work of the law. We know what we do if it's holy or what we do is evil. We do what is good and what is bad. So that God has put that morality in all of us. But there are some people with good morality and no morality. They distort the good and bad. All right, That's why their life goes haywiring. And then this conscience. Conscience is something that God has placed in us to tell us. And if we do something wrong, the conscience will convict us. If we do something right, our conscience will feel assured. Okay, we are doing something. So this is... God building in us a warning system, telling us, don't do this. Telling us, if you do this, it is bad. It's not pleasing to God. It's offensive to God. So God has created in us a conscience to telling us that. So when you tell people, you have no conscience, right? you just tell people, you have no conscience, means this person has lost his degree of consciousness. He, know, he has no bearing of what is right and wrong. So in Chinese, right, sometimes I say, on the Liang Xing, so something like that, right? You have no conscience at all. You, you have no compassion. You have no nothing about right and wrong. Okay, that's what it meant. So the morality argument tells us we have a sense of morality. All of us, in some sense, know what is right and wrong. We know we don't kill. We know if somebody falls or poor man needs food, we want to give the heart of compassion. We know it's good and evil. It's wrong to rock. It's good to share. So this is some sense of morality. So it also means that there must be a standard that is right or wrong. There must be absolute standard telling us what is right, what is wrong. And what does it mean? There must be a moral law giver. And who is the moral law giver? The God or the scripture who tells us not even the Ten Commandments, not even the written law of the Old Testament, even the word of the New Testament. These are the wonderful word of God that tells us God is holy. He is righteous. He loves justice. He wants things that are good, that are pleasing to him. And Hebrews, the unknown author, tells us this 11 verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. What does it mean? If you are a believer, you believe in Jesus Christ by faith. As a true believer, don't doubt. You must believe that God exists. The true believer can only please God through faith. Not by how 
clever, how smart you are using different kind of arguments to prove God. No. You just need to believe God exists and He rewards those who seek after Him. Okay? So, um, all of us can please God. All of us have faith to trust in God and all of us believe strongly that He exists. And now, the question is, how do we know who is the true God? There are so many gods, right? This religion says it's the true God. That religion says it's the true God. Now, how, how do we know? Who do we believe? Now, let, let me analyze this in, in this sense, okay? We are all finite human beings. Finite means we are constrained by our flesh. We are constrained by our time. Some of us can live longer, 50 over years old, 40 years old, 60 years old, 70, 80 years old. We are confined by this space. We cannot move out of our dimension. The most we probably can travel to the moon, maybe next time, bring us to Elon Musk, bring us to the Mars or whatever. But we are still confined with this space. And we have metal. All right, we are, we are restrained by a lot of metal around us. We are in this dimension of creation. All right? There is no way for us to extrapolate or break through this time-space matter to find out what is beyond time-space matter. No matter how clever or science is, which I don't think science is that clever, it's just a discovery of God's law or nature, no matter how philosophical a person is, we can never break through this time-space and matter. Because we are finite, we are created, and worst of all, we are all corrupted by sin. Finite, created, and corrupted. In this aspect, how can we know what is beyond time-space matter to find the sick and true God? No way. The only way is finite man can never phantom the infinite God. The infinite God reveals himself to us. Us. Only the infinite God outside of this time space matter reveals himself to us, then we can know God. And the only way God does that is through Christ and through his word. Of course, through creation, constant general revelation, which we talked about earlier. The special revelation is through Jesus Christ and by his word. And I want to thank God for that. Because of his special revelation, we can see God in human flesh in the, in the life of Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ reveals God's nature fully and more than 100%. We see Jesus, we see God. And through the word that left before us, you see, imagine we, don't, we can't see Jesus Christ now, right? We cannot go back to 2,000 over years ago. But Jesus Christ left behind his word, his Bible that all of us can read every day and to be immersed into his word, to immerse into his him speaking to us every day. That is God's grace, that is God's beauty for us. Now, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, Jesus Christ is the Word, and Jesus Christ, God the Son, was God. Okay, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, I, I love the way that John writes this uh, uh, passage. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John is so plain and write it as it is. He did not explain any further, but he tells us as a matter of fact. Word, word was with God, and the Word was God. And this is very important. I will talk about Trinity um, on my third lesson. Stay with me. If you want to know more about Trinity, it will be lesson three. All right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That is the beauty of God the Son, God the Father as one, yet in two persons, the Trinity is pictured here. And the word became flesh, which means God taking on additional human flesh, humanity, and we have seen God's glory. The only way we have to believe what John said, because John really lived with Jesus almost 24-7. These disciples follow Jesus everywhere he goes, listens, hear what he says, see his miracles, and we can trust what he said. We've seen his glory. Glory as the own Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus is God who came in human flesh. And Jesus said, no one, John said, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So John, uh, you don't say that he's contradicting himself. Hey, John, you say that Jesus, uh, the only God, but hey, how come it's the Father's side? And he has made him known. Jesus made God known, yet he's the only God. Now, how does it gel? Stay with me until chapter lesson three and you 
that I will explain to know. But it is very plain when we see Jesus Christ, the special revelation, we know God exists. All right? Because Jesus in his life, he expressed love to people. God is love. And Jesus manifests God in his healing, in his miracle, in his act of wonder. And Jesus even is so, uh, uh, does not compromise sin as he is rebuked those who are um, against God, those who speak lies, those who are speak falsehood. Jesus did not mean his word and rebuke them. Jesus expressed his nature in his anger where he drives the people out of the temple who trade in God's house. Jesus expressed his, his Godhood or Jesus expressed his divine nature in his everyday lives. Jesus revealed to God in his life. We see that is a special revelation of God given to us in the life of Jesus. So, some people ask, hey, did Jesus himself declare to be God? Of course, definitely, yes. Let me share with you some scripture very quickly. Um, that Jesus himself absolutely declared himself so plainly and directly that he's God. All right? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever for the Father does, that the Son does likewise. What does it mean? For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. God reveals himself from the Bible through the life of Jesus Christ. We see what Jesus does. We see what God the Father does. Jesus is saying, if you look at me, what I'm doing now, you see God is doing that. You see me, you see God. What I do is what God does what God does. Jesus says more than I'm God. Okay? The, Jesus declares himself as equal with God by doing what God is doing. Again, in John chapter 8, verse 19, they said to him, therefore, where is your father? The Jews are asking Jesus. Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. You know what Jesus is saying? If we know Jesus Christ, you know who God is because Jesus is God. Don't, don't look for the Father everywhere, elsewhere, anywhere. Just look for me, Jesus said. If you see me, you know me, you know God because I am God. I reveal what God the Father is revealing. And again, John chapter 8 verse 28, there's so many verses which I, I have to put it in because it is so rich and powerful, and I don't want you all to miss it. Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. So Jesus is saying, I'm not going to say anything else other than what the Father says. All right? And he's saying, when we hear Jesus' words, we hear God's words. Jesus is saying exactly what God says. Jesus is God. And John 14 verse 8, you know, when Jesus um, uh, was talking to the disciples, Philip, you know, Philip, the one who, who, who doubt God and asked questions as well, you know, sometimes, okay, say, Philip said to him, show us the Father and it is not for us. I want to see the Father. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long that you still do not know me? Philip, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus said, I don't need to show you the Father anymore because God is in me. I am God. You've seen me. You've seen the Father. God reveals himself from the Bible through Jesus Christ. We see Jesus. We see God. And we see Jesus. We know God. All right? You will know God if you know Jesus. So Jesus is the special revelation from the scripture. And again, this is one of the very obvious ones. John chapter 8, verse 56 or 59. See, when Jesus was talking to the Jews, right? Okay. And then Jesus tell the Jews, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, um, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Because Abraham was long ago in the Old Testament, right? 
Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up the stones to throw at him. Why? Because, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Why did the Jews pick up the stone and throw, throw at Jesus? Because Jesus is claiming I am, which is the I am who I am. He's the Yahweh of the Old Testament. And Jesus said, I am even before Abraham was. And the people say, you must be mad. You put yourself as God, a divine being. Is it? The Jews knew that Jesus claimed to be God. That's why he, they thought that he was blasphemy. And he wanted to throw a person who is a blasphemer that he's God. So the Jews know that Jesus is saying, he is God, the I am, the one before even Abraham was. And then John chapter 10, verse 30 to 33, another different episode. I'm using the same picture. He's Jesus tell the people, I and the Father are one. Ah. When Jesus said that, right, the Jews cannot take it anymore. They picked up the stone and again to stone him. Jesus answered, un answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? I do so many good things, you want to stone me? For what? Then the Jews answered him, It is not for good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. So Jesus don't have to say, I'm God, which me. No need. The way Jesus articulate, the way Jesus spoke, the conversation that Jesus had, I and the Father are one before Abraham. I was. Jesus is speaking very plainly that I am God. Which is why the Jews are so angry that you make yourself God and going to stone you. The Jews understood that. Okay. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. No human being, no normal man or mankind will say words like that. I am the light of the world. If any pastor or any elder or any deacon say, I am the light, you must be saying, this person must be bad. Only Jesus dared to say that. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. Because Jesus is, I am who I am. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you see, when Christ comes in the first coming, the scripture all points us toward Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ points us toward God. You want to know God? You want to have increased knowledge of God? You want to have an intimate relationship with God? To Christ. To Christ, you go to God. Through Christ, you know God. And through the scripture, the scripture points us toward God as well. Okay? Jesus is the only Savior. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So the Bible is so clear. The Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the special revelation to us, we are so blessed. We have God's grace and mercy at our time, lifetime. We get to know Jesus Christ. We get to have faith in Him, to believe in Him, and through Him, we have access to God. That's why when Jesus died and rose, the whole temple curtain is split into half. We have direct access to God through Christ, who broke His life for us. That is what gospel is all about, salvation in no one else. So how can we know God more and more? Yes, 2,000 years ago, those people rejected Jesus Christ except for the 12 disciples and, and the church that formed after that. Today, we have the benefit of, of retrospectively looking back through the Old Testament and New Testament to know about Jesus Christ. All the more we are blessed because we are post the cross. We have the word of God to tell us. We have the Bible. Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. I love this. Because Jesus said, if you read my word, if you obey my word, it proves that you love me. This is a love relationship with me. And not only you love me, my father and I will love you back as well, or because we are a source of love. We love you first, and then we are going to show that love by living in you together. Father and I, living, making our home with you. So we have perfect fellowship with God. We know God, we read His Word, we keep His Word. We know God because God is in us. He makes His home in us. We can know God because Jesus is in us. And we keep God's Word. We can be sure that the Father and Son is in us. This is where God 
fellowship and union is. The Father, the Son, as with us, even the Spirit. Whoever has the Spirit of God has eternal life. Okay, So the only for, way for us to know God is through the Scripture. And the only way for us to know God is to know and believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior as revealed through the pages of the Scripture. Okay, uh, I like what Pastor John MacArthur has quoted this. He says this, There must be a God who is infinite, eternal, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, personal, emotional, volitional, moral, spiritual, aesthetic, holy, just, loving, and living. It's all there. And you pick up the Bible, and the Bible substantiates every bit of that. God is. He is the I am. Okay. So for the next few lessons, um, uh, next, next week, we will know more about who is God, what is God like, and then lesson three, I'm going to talk about the Trinity. Lesson four, five, and six, I will talk more about the attributes of God. All right. Um, I, 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 if, uh, uh, this is the end of the lesson. I've come to the end, last page. I uh, apologize for not giving you any break in between because I thought I want to finish the flow of today's lesson. And I thank you for your attention. All right. Um, I have come to the end of the lesson. May I ask uh, Reverend Gunn? Reverend Gunn, are you there to close us yes. with a word yes. of prayer? Yeah. Sure, yes, sure. Yes. Come, let's uh, unite our hearts in closing in prayer. Come, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a very wonderful reminder and summary of an important, important topic of on who you are. Thank you for Elder Jason for putting much effort in uh, putting all your revelation together for us to understand how we can go about knowing you, how you come about into existence, and indeed, Lord, there's no way we as finite human beings can understand you who are infinite. God, thank you for the reminder that indeed eternal life begins through knowing you and not in heaven. We pray, Lord, that your word that has been spoken today, tonight through the lips of our beloved servant, Elder Jason, will help to draw us closer to you, to want to seek to know you more, understand you more and please you more. So help us, God, and have great, great mercy on us. We thank you and ask all this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. for Thank, you. thank, you, thank you, Elder Jason. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Elder Jason. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. 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 Good night